everyone. Welcome back to day two. Um, happy day two, as I'd like to say. Um, from yesterday, we went over uh, a little bit. We finished up our lesson with a little bit of the functions of ingredients and stuff that go in cookies. Um, so today, we're going to start going more in depth with all of the ingredients and all of the things and mixing methods into cookies. So kind of with like a little agenda for today, we're going to do a PowerPoint lecture. Um, I have an activity that I passed you out. Um, so I pass out the activity and I also pass out a Cornell note-taking sheet that is two-sided. So you're going to see one column says ingredients and mixing methods and the other side is just your notes. So if you, my advice to you would be put flour on one side, write all your notes about flour on the other. Um, don't write anything on the back yet, the back is for the um, And then we're going to do the activity like I said and then I have two demos for you. Um, we're going to do two different types of um, so we're going to talk about the foundations of ingredients, um, the five ingredients that make a cookie what a cookie is, um, the ratio of those ingredients, we're going to talk about the baking process, and a good final texture of the cookie. Um, so flour, the, what does flour give us? Structure. Exactly. Um, and what flour should I use? Do you guys have any, any idea of what flour we should use? Any guesses, Robert? Maybe um, all purpose? Yes. General? Perfect. So there are three main flowers that kind of encompass the whole flower group. Um, one being bread, two pastry, and three is cake. Um, so for cookies, we want to use a softer wheat flour. So like Robert said, AP would be perfect, but AP isn't in one of our little classifications. So I like to call AP flour flour one and a half. So it's basically a two to one ratio of bread flour and pastry flour. So if you don't have it in your kitchen, or you ran out of it, but you happen to have bread flour, pastry flour on hand, you can make it yourself and still use the same recipe without having to convert everything, um, which is kind of nice. Um, and sugar, so we're going, gonna wanna use a fine sugar. Um, it's gonna give us all the things like tenderness and sweetness. Um, it's a stabilizer to the fat, which is actually really nice, um, which we'll go into um, in a little bit. Um, it also gives us color, because as you know, when you caramelize sugar or put it Anywhere with heat, it's going to change colors, which is nice, and that's kind of what we're looking for. Uh, so why would we use a fine sugar as opposed to a coarse sugar? You don't want to chunks of sugar when you're using a whole. Exactly, but there's something else. Texture. Yes, also something else. factor when we're making the cookies. 
Um, so when we do the creaming method, for example, we're going to do the butter and the sugar, and we're going to add eggs. There is a protein in the egg yolks that you can our emulsification. Does anybody remember what that's called? Yeah? Lessonin? Yes, yes. Um, so eggs are also going to help the incorporation of the air, which is also important um, in our cooking and the creaming method to make sure everybody is happy in the bowl. Um, and like I said, moisture. <laughs> now we're going to talk about leavening agents. Um, the leavening agents we're going to use are part of the chemical leavening. Um, so we're going to use baking soda and baking powder primarily. Um, also physical leavening with the steam and whatnot. But the two main ones we're going to use are baking soda and baking powder. Um, I like to remember baking soda and baking powder by the following little thing. Um, I associate baking soda with spread. So the S in soda and the S in spread are the same. So that's how I remember what baking soda does. And the P in powder goes with the P in poop. So baking powder poofs things a little bit more than baking soda does, but baking soda is going to spread things a little bit more than baking powder will. Um, and like I said, it helps things rise and it also adds um, aids in the tenderization of the product. So it helps all of those gas cells expand that we incorporate when we incorporate the air. In the um, so now we're going to move on to the mixing methods. Um, so there are three main mixing methods that we're going to be using. Um, well, I should say two. One of them we don't really use too much, but I still want you guys to know it. It's going to be on the exam. So we're going to go over it. Um, so we're going to go over the creaming method, the one-stage method, and the whipping method. Um, we're going to go over their differences and uses and techniques. So the one-stage method is also called the blending method. This is used a lot with like quick, quick breads and muffins and things like that. Um, it is with the use of a liquid fat. So what, it make, what makes it the blending method is that everything other than sugar is a liquid, besides obviously the flour. But liquid is the most important. So if you ever see a recipe that says melt the butter or use vegetable oil or any sort of oil, you're going to think blending method. Um, and then you add the eggs and then you add the dry ingredients. Um, it is the only method that you could or should mix by hand. Um, so muffins we typically can, we could use, or could get away with using a whisk. Um, I personally still like to use the mixer. I just think it's easier for me. It's a little bit more efficient. Um, yeah. So the framing method is the most common and one of the most important methods that you're ever going to learn in your baking career. You use the creaming method li literally for everything, unless it's the blending method or the whipping method. But most of them are encompass the creaming method. Um, temperature is one of the most important things when you are creaming anything. Um, so you want to make sure all of your ingredients are at room temperature um, or like ambient temperature, whatever feels room temperature for you. So like this butter has been sitting out for a while, I can stick my finger in it and it's room temperature. Um, so the eggs also, I'm not going to stick my finger in the eggs, but they're also room temperature, they're not cold. Um, this aids in what I like to call the circle of life of, <laughs> of the creamy method. Um, so the temperature is important. The temperature aids in the air incorporation of the cookie or of anything that you're making. And the air incorporation aids in the emulsification process, which then goes back to the temperature. So if you look at it like a circle, everything encompasses each other as they go around the circle. That's why I call it a circle of life. Yeah? So what would happen if one of those was cold? Like what if the butter was cold? So if the butter was cold, you could either zap it in the microwave to get it to your ambient temperature or it would just take a little longer. Um, so the same thing with the eggs. So if I put the butter and the sugar in the bowl with cold butter, I would have to cream it a little bit longer to get that light and fluffy texture. Um, the same thing with the eggs. If my eggs were cold, but everything else was at room temperature, I would get light and fluffy really fast, but when I added the eggs, it would seize. So I would have to whip it or mix it longer to get it back together, or I could torch the side of the bowl to kind of get that butter to emulsify um, back into one cookie. And if you zap the butter in the microwave and it starts to melt, can you use melted butter? Yes, then you would switch to the blending method. Mm -hmm. So the order of ingredients for each of the mixing methods are the same. It's kind of just the way you put them together. Um, so your cookie texture is going to be a little bit different if you started with a creaming method recipe and then accidentally melted the butter and couldn't wait for it to harden up again. You still could use it melted, it's just going to like differentiate your texture. Yeah. Is that because the, the butter doesn't 
hold the air? Yeah, so with the blending method, we're going to see um, it's not going to hold the air. There's nothing for the sugar cells to grow, like grab onto, um, or there's nothing for the sugar cells to go into. Um, so when we cream the butter and the sugar, we use a fine sugar because of the, its structure. Um, so when we cream it, it has the butter has places to land to make those air cells to make it expand and be nice and light. Um, yeah. So depending on how much air you incorporate, it's also going to affect how much a cookie spreads. So no matter how much baking powder or baking soda I put in a cookie, it's not really going to do anything unless my ratios are right. So as we're going to see in the cookie activity, if I don't add enough flour but I added all this baking powder, my cookie's not gonna poof and still be a cookie. It's still gonna expand and spread a little bit more because I don't have the right ratio of flour. Um, and it also, emulsification is also one of the most important things, like Sarah had said. Um, we wanna add the eggs slowly, and we want them to be at the right temperature. So we get a really creamy, light and fluffy, cohesive unit before we add the flour and kind of destroy a little bit of questions? Cool. Um, so the whipping method um, is used by whipping eggs and sugar to the ribbon stage. So usually we're going to use a whip. You can use a paddle, um, but the whip is probably the best to use. Um, so you would put the eggs and the sugar in a bowl and you would whip it on pretty high until it became kind of pale. Um, and then once you thought you got to the right stage, you would lift up the whisk. And when the eggs and the sugar fall back into the bowl, it's going to ribbon and kind of look like ribbon candy. So does anybody know what ribbon candy is? It's going to look like that as it flows back into the bowl. So that's when you know that you are ready to fold in your dry ingredients. We're going to fold in the dry ingredients instead of just kind of add them in and go all crazy um, because we don't want to destroy all those nice fluffy air cells that we just made with all of the eggs and the sugar. Um, so it's going to be a lighter cookie in both texture and color unless you bake it to God knows when. Um, it's going to be a lighter, kind of cakey, more textury cookie. Um, an example would be Ladyfingers. I know um, I worked at a place that we didn't order Ladyfingers. We made our own to make tiramisu, um, which was kind of fun. It was kind of just like a learning experience. I've never used the whipping method to make cookies before. Um, so it kind of just goes to show that you can use all three of these methods for all of the baking things that you could ever need to do, which I think is really cool and really um, so now we're going to talk about the baking time te uh, temperatures. The two factors that make this the most one of the most important things, I feel like they're all kind of important, um, is the size of your scoop and how you scoop your cookie dough. Um, if you have a mounded scoop and you put them all on the tray, you have a mounded scoop and then a level scoop and then a mounded scoop, they're all not going to bake the same, right? So we all need to make sure that they're the same size, the same shape. Um, I also like to stagger my cookies. You guys know what staggering means? So you do like three, two, three, two. Um, just so my cookies don't bake together or they don't, or aren't misshapen. I like a really round, nice cookie. Um, so that's just another thing to be mindful of. Make sure um, your scoops are level, that they're even, they're flat. Um, we want to bake cookies at 325 to 350 degrees. Um, that's because if you bake them at 300 degrees, it'll take significantly longer to bake. Um, if you bake them too high, it'll bake too fast, and it'll kind of burn the outsides a little bit, and then the inside will still be raw. So you won't have that time for the butter and the sugar and stuff to night melt all nice and make a perfect cookie. Um, and then, like I said, we want to bake them for 8 to 12 minutes, and it goes back to using butter and fine sugar, so all of the ingredients melt cohesively to make a cookie. So now I'm going to get out of the way so you can see all of this. Um, but this is our cookie activity. So I've given it to you kind of in pairs. Um, so not everyone uh, will have this activity, but you all should all be able to see it. Um, and then I gave you a word bank. So I want you to use that word bank to pair the words to the numbers of the cookie. And then we're going to go over it and see what everybody thinks. So I'll just give you guys a few minutes to get ready for the next thing here.
to let me know, okay? Just a guess? Just a guess? So if we look at this one, 
we can see that it's really pale, but you guys were on the right track that you said not enough sugar because it's pale. But baking powder doesn't aid in color at all. So if we added all baking powder or even too much baking powder, it wouldn't assist in that Maillard browning process that happens in the oven. Um, and like I said, we can't taste these, but it also would taste really artificial. Um, they would not taste that great. So now we have two left, under cream and no eggs. Where do we think they're going to go? No eggs on six. No eggs on six. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yep. So it looks too sweet and looks like the flour starting to take over here. So I'll show you when I scoop, but you can see kind of the ridges of the scoop here. So that would mean the flour starting to take over. There's nothing to emulsify it all together. So not under cream would be here. So this cookie is kind of flat. So there was probably not as much air incorporation as let's say this cookie. This cookie looks pretty good. They just left it in the oven a little too long. So that one, you can see it's kind of, just doesn't look as nice as the other cookies, along with this one. So I would say this little pocket right here, I don't know how well you guys can see it on your paper. This little pocket right here is probably all butter and sugar. This probably has no flour in it whatsoever. So, yeah. Yep. If you had to eat one of them, what would be the best one? Um, so that's actually the next thing I wanted oh. to go over. So we're, we want to shoot between one, three, and eight. So all baking powder, it looks like a nice circular cookie, and it has a little even distribution of the chocolate chips. So that's what we like from number one. Number three, again, even distribution. Maybe we just forgot to scrape once when we added the flour. We just went for it, and that's how we got that pocket of just butter and sugar. And the last one I think is a perfect cookie. I just think they forgot to set their timer. Um, so that's why I think timers are so important. Um, or just if you have a good internal clock, it's like, oh, my cookies are in the oven. You can go back and check them, and hopefully you can catch them on time. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys like that activity. I thought that was kind of fun. You guys did a really good job trying to pick it out. Um, even in the face of defeat, y'all picked back up and kept trying, so that's cool. Um, so now we're going to go into the demo portion. Um, so first I'm going to do a salted brown butter chocolate chip cookie using the blending method. Um, can anybody else tell me what is the method that's called, what is the other name for the blending method? Sorry, that was really jumbled. Sarah? One state. Yeah, exactly. So, does anybody know what brown butter actually is? The milk solids in Sort of, we cook the milk solids off. It's actually the butter fat. I don't know if you guys can see this. If you can, I can pass it around. But you see all the little kind of floaties in the bottom? That's actually just the butter fat. So when we cook the butter, we cook it a little past um, like translucent. So you can see the butter is really clear and you can see all the little floaties in the bottom. So if you guys want to pass it around to the pan, just give it back to you because that's my starting point. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's the only one that you could or should do by hand, but I'm going to use the mixer because I like the mixer. Um, and if you notice with that brown butter, I didn't really take it as dark as I could have. Um, the butter fat in the bottom really isn't that brown at all. Um, I just really <coughs> didn't want to go for such a smoky flavor in a cookie. I think it still needs to be sweet and we're gonna add chocolate chips, so yeah. Would taking the butter the next step uh, do anything different to the cookie? Would something happen just no. flavor? Yeah, it just, it just kind of a flavor thing. And that's again, like a personal preference thing. I just don't really like how smoky you can get your brown butter to put in a cookie. If you were making um, like a sauce like James did and browned the butter before he added the wine maybe, um, it would just bring on a whole different flavor that I don't really think is appropriate for making a cookie, um, just because we want it to stay kind of sweet. So we're gonna add the butter and all those solids right in the bottom. Um, and then I'm gonna add my granulated sugar and my brown sugar, which is kind of stuck. Do you always have to use both brown and white sugar for No, products? we're going to get there. Hold okay. that thought. Hold that thought. We're going to get there. So we're going to just turn this on, and I am really not looking for anything to happen in this one. This one is kind of just like making the sugars kind of wet um, because we're not really incorporating any air because it doesn't really matter, per se, to this mixing method. So we're just, once everything's all in here, 
show you guys this, just because the next one is so drastic. So this one is really just like crumbly. You know, if you guys ever made like cinnamon buns before and you put melted butter with cinnamon and sugar and you smear it on the inside? That's kind of what we're going for. So you can see it's all like just crumbly and that's fun because we're not trying to incorporate as much as any air in this cookie dough. And that's another question I want to bring up. Does anybody know why we call it a cookie dough, cookie dough, or a cake batter, a cake batter? Does anybody have an idea? Yeah. Amount of liquid? Yep. So a cake batter is something that's horrible. So if I put like cake batter, let's say in like a pitcher or even like a container like this, I could pour it out in one stream. You can't pour a cookie dough out of like a container or even a bowl. So now I have two eggs. I have my vanilla. I'm just going to add them together. It doesn't really matter. You could keep them separate if you want. I just like to add them together. Um, same with the creamy method. I like to do one at a time. Try not to get the snot. So we're going to evenly incorporate that. And same thing, I think scraping is really, really important. When you're making cookies, you want to incorporate all of those ingredients, especially the ones that get trapped under that little nub. I don't know how familiar you guys are with like the bowls and stuff for any of the kitchenaids or any mixer that you're really going to come in contact with. There's always this little nub. And all of the ingredients like to get trapped around this circle. So you're going to lose a lot of your ingredients probably it's all wrong. Wow, I should take this off. Um, but you guys get the idea. Um, they get trapped there, and that's probably what the not creamed properly cookie looks like um, because they probably just got trapped in a little nub. Yeah. Do you ever use that kind of uh, uh, paddle or whatnot that has a little rubber lip on it? So my KitchenAid at home actually has the little scraper, and I like it. But it still doesn't get under the little nub. Like I still find that ingredients get stuck. It's nice for scraping the sides. So when I just take my lift the top off, I can just scrape under real quick and it saves a little bit of time. Um, but it's still fine that I get ingredients stuck in the little nub. So now we're gonna add another egg, the rest of the vanilla. So I have, who I have in this one? I just have baking soda in this. So we're gonna do just baking soda and in my flour. Um, again, you can leave them separate. It doesn't really matter. I just think it saves a little bit of time when I'm making a lot of cookies at once, I guess. So I'm going to show this to you again once the eggs are in it because we have a nice emulsification going on in here with those egg yolks. But again, I'm really not incorporating anything, so it's not going to look like much. We're going to see how drastic of a change it is between the creamy method and this one. Um, that's why I chose to do this one first. So this one, again, there's nothing, there's nothing to it. It's just melted butter, some sugar, and some eggs. But it also doesn't look broken. So if I had added the eggs too quickly, or maybe the eggs were cold, it would have seized that melted butter, and I would have had to do like the torch trick, or just mixed it forever. And there's like a little saying that I think most of you have heard before, do it right or do it twice. Um, so, which is kind of like aggressive, I think, but I also think that it's super important. Um, if you're on a time schedule and you're making a specific production schedule and you can't follow it because you overcreamed or you added the eggs too fast to your cookie dough, it can really screw up your production for the day. So this, I'm just gonna add my flour on the one. that butter that we just seized with the eggs. 
Um, so yeah, I would just like take a little torch and light it up and just like kind of go under here nice and gently and evenly. Um, and it would re-emulsify for you. Thanks. So I'm going to show this to you one more time before I add the chocolate chips. So this kind of just looks like a paste right now. You can like pick it up and play with it. If you got a small play with it, I'll pass it around. But um, it's just like a paste. And creamed cookie dough is gonna look a little like this, but it's gonna be a little fluffy. Um, this one's a little bit more dense, but that's kind of what we're going for for the molded or uh, one stage cookie, I should say. Um, we're not really incorporating anything. We're not really spending as much time on this as we would um, a cookie with a creamy method or anything with a creamy method uh, for that matter. So this, I just have an unmeasured amount of chocolate chips. So I'm really measure my chocolate chips. I just think that's something that you can just look and see if there's an area. You're going to get a chocolate chip in every scoop um, kind of thing. Um, and I like a lot of chocolate, so I tend to add a little bit more chocolate chips than I'm supposed to, but we don't really, we don't talk about that. We, kind of just, we just let that one go. So now that my chocolate chips are added, I'm going to take this down. And it's going to break apart because it's still so doughy, but once we start to pack the scoop, it'll be, it'll be A-O. It's really important. I know I keep saying everything's the most important thing, um, but there are a lot of factors that really um, help make a cookie what it is. Um, each thing needs to be done kind of carefully and thoughtfully um, to make sure that your cookie comes out the way it's supposed to in the time that you want to. So we're going to take this, and I like to just press it right up against the bowl, flatten it, clean off the sides a little bit if you get some done. So what I was talking about before with one of them, I don't remember which one it was. Um, number six, which was, I have my little cheat sheet here. Does anybody remember what six was? No eggs. Six is no eggs. So if we look at this cookie ball right here, you could see where the scoop kind of pushed the cookie dough out. You can see where it kind of traps the cookie dough in here. So you can see that if I were to add maybe the wrong ingredient or the wrong thing of flour, it would come out like this and I'd be like, hmm, that's not, that's not a one stage cookie. Why does my cookie dough look like this? And I could bake one and see what happens and kind of just like test it out um, and then maybe fix it from there. So what I like to do, maybe not in a class setting or <coughs> anything like that, but if I were making a big batch of cookie dough and I just had a feeling that something went wrong, I would bake one or two. I would take like a sizzle plate from the line, um, put some parchment paper on it, and I would bake one or two. And if they came out fine, it would be good. I would go about my day and I would go start scooping. Um, but if they came out maybe like the one with not enough flour and all the edges started to burn, I could go back to my recipe and I could adjust it from there before wasting all of that cookie dough um, to not have flour. So for this, I'm not going to scoop the whole tray. Just to show you the staggering process. So, you guys can see, I don't know how well it's going to stay, but you can see that I staggered them. So when they bake, let's take my marker here, when they bake into a circle, they're not going to bake into each other. Okay, that circle might have been a little too big, but they're not going to bake into each other. They're just going to bake to like a nice circle cookie, and that's what we're going for. So now is where the fun starts. We're going to do the creaming method next. Ooh, make sure you get that on. Um, I'm going to use the same paddle because it's the same ingredient, so it doesn't really matter um, one way or the other. It's still a combination of flour and sugar. So back to your question. Do I always need to use brown sugar and white sugar? The answer is no, because with this cookie, I'm making a molasses cookie. And do you guys remember what brown sugar is actually made of? Sugar and molasses. Sugar and molasses, exactly. So I'm going to use all white sugar, but I'm going to add molasses. So in a way, I'm just using brown sugar, which you could, and then just add a smaller amount of molasses. Oh, I'll screw it up. So for these, before I forget our salted component, I would just push them down a little bit, just so the salt kind of has like a home. And then I would take just, just a little pinch because you don't want it to be too salty. And I would just sprinkle 
some limon balm salt on there, and it would bake. Some of the smaller ones would bake into the cookie, which I think is kind of nice. Um, and then the ones that were too big to melt in the oven um, would kind of just flake off on top, which I think is really aesthetically pleasing for me. Um, I just think that's like a cool little. So I'm going to start with all my sugar and my very soft butter. And we're going to turn that on. And we're going to go a little higher than I had for the blending method, um, just because we're trying to incorporate all of that air. I need to quickly. So with soft butter, what the butter is going to want to do, and what I'm kind of noticing now, is that it'll like hit and spin around the bowl, and then as it starts to create friction, it'll get stuck to the bowl, and all of the sugar kind of houses at the bottom. So you're really going to want to, this is kind of one of the ones where I think it's more important to scrape the bowl, because I'll show you what I mean. All of the butter is just beating against the side of the bowl, but there's still a pretty good amount of sugar down here that we want to incorporate to trap all of that air. So we're going to put it back on, and we're going to scrape it, and we're going to let it go. Does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, so while I'm finishing this up, I think I'm going to have you guys multitask a little bit. Um, you remember I told you not to write on the back of your Cornell note-taking sheet? Um, so for right now, I want you guys to think we're going to do a little like three, two, one activity that we'll go over once I finish the creaming method. Um, so I want you guys to write down or just think about, you don't really have to write it down. Um, I want you guys to think about three things that you didn't know um, before I started the lesson, whether it be ingredients or the creaming method or baking temperature, anything. Um, two things that you were surprised with or that you learned. And one thing that you're going to do differently when you make cookies on your own, either at home or at work. We're going to jazz this up because I want to get this going. method is a good kind of alternative because um, if you were to like oh 
I know that the bowl is going to be cold. Let me put some butter in the microwave and make it that much warmer. Um, you could still use it in here. Or if I wanted to torch the bowl and make it go faster, but I, we're okay right now. So we're just going to keep on keeping on. So I just think it's interesting how cold, like we're in a pretty ambient temperature room, I think, right? So I think it's just kind of interesting how your equipment reacts to the room that you're in. If this room was so much colder, this bowl probably would be like ice and I wouldn't be able to get anything done, maybe without the torch. Um, so I just think it's really, it's just an interesting topic to think about. So this looks like a pretty good butter egg sugar mixture. So I don't know, you can't really see it because I creamed it pretty well, but I didn't, didn't scrape the bowl at the bottom. So you can kind of see where the butter and the sugar kind of try to adapt those eggs. And that's what's kind of important. So I'm gonna make sure I scrape this again before I add the flour. Oh, I should add the vanilla first though, huh? Right? Might be a good idea. this quickly. Can anybody share their 3, 2, 1 activity? Anybody? Charlie? Um, so, what, uh, the one thing I found really interesting, you said baking powder for food and baking uh, soda for spread. I thought that was a really good amount of advice to use that and go back more often. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, like, my two and three are kind of the same. So I was like, when do you use the brown butter to add like, a nutty flavor? And then it kind of like, opened my mind. Like, oh my god, you could like, make it nutty or only less nutty. Yeah, you can kind of control the flavors with that, which I think is cool. So with this, I kind of just want to show you guys a really cool technique. So this is the molasses here, right? So I have scissors, and I'm just going to, instead of trying to scrape it out of a plastic container, I'm just going to cut the bottom here, and all the molasses is just going to drain right in. And it's kind of just like a little mess-free way to add like inverted syrups and stuff. So I'm going to add that right to the mixing butter and sugar and try not to get it all over my fingers. And now I have my dry ingredients. I have my baking soda, my baking powder, and all of my spices in here. So I'm just going to do a quick little scrape on this. Anybody else have a 3, 2, 1 that they wanted to share? That was a little different from Charlie's. G? Um, I didn't really get to finish all mine, but I really like Yeah. 